All right. Hi, everybody. This is Tracy with the first events team. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Just a few very quick reminders before we get started. All attendees are muted. Uh, if you are using the event app, we encourage you to check into sessions, play around, update your activities, uh, complete the session survey at the end. If you are having any trouble, please email us at events at first.org and we can help you out there. Um, Again, a reminder that the session is TLP white and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app or the desktop site. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce you to your session moderator, Olivier. Hello to all of you virtual attendees. So I'm Olivier Kalef, I'm a first liaison, and I'll be moderating this session today. Uh, so I'm working for uh, Sanofi, a global health and pro uh, pharmaceutical company. And as you may imagine, we are busy both from a research perspective and from a cyber perspective. Uh, just one item before we get started, uh, the question and answer will be at the end of this talk. So feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A feature in your Zoom browser. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, I was part of the uh, 2020 Program Conference Committee, and I'm happy to introduce this presentation by uh, Brandon Grimes, who is the chief of the Industrial Control Systems Group under the CISA's Hunt and Incident Response Team, uh, and Derek Mayer, who is also a member of the same of the same group. And uh, I would say the floor is yours. Derek, Brandon. Hey, good morning, everyone, or good morning from the East Coast. So um, my name is Brandon Grimes, and I am uh, the Deputy Chief of the ICS section. I'm actually currently serving in a role as, a, uh, as an engagement lead for incident response for CISA right now. And then Derek Meyer. Uh, Derek, I'll turn the floor over to you, but he leads most of our uh, research and development team for ICS. Yeah, correct. Uh, I help with a couple other projects oversee various uh, work we do for research and capabilities and uh, malware analysis and stuff like that. Yep. And so what we're going to be talking to you guys today about is, is really the physical consequences from from cyber attacks, you know, obviously talking about industrial control systems, uh, specific cyber attacks. And we're actually going to be using the MITRE attack for ICS framework to do so and really focusing on that impact tactic to, uh, to demonstrate the physical consequence. So who are we? Um, we are the nation's risk advisors. So in the United States, um, almost 90% of critical infrastructure is actually private owned and operated. And based on the various sectors and regulatory agencies and authorities, um, it's not always a clean match in terms of you know, the government, the private sector working together. So CISA is very, um, um, I guess I would say passively involved in the sense that we don't do as much direct support like the hunt and incident response that our team specifically does. Uh, we're kind of in the minority. So uh, we really try to advise and get involved with the community and try to, uh, try to move the needle forward that way. Going to skip through these uh, these stock slides that the external affairs folks make us add. So yes, um, essentially we we have um, we have several responsibilities. Um, what we do work with the public and the private sector to do uh, various cybersecurity services. There. All right, uh, <clears throat> the worldwide threat assessment. Uh, Russia remains pretty much our our biggest adversary. Um, they're kind of the most capable of any other countries, um, the most talent, hardest to, to follow and such. Um, so obviously we're going to keep our eyes on them for years to come. Uh, China, they're about as powerful. They, in previous years, they used to do a lot of, uh, still a lot of in, uh, intellectual property, but they've progressed over uh, recent years and become a little more of a, uh, a threat in the sense that they want to cause destruction, kind of like Russia potentially would. Uh, and then Iran, um, they have a lot of want uh, and their capabilities are growing. Um, they also have highly malicious intent, um, not just stealing intellectual property. And then North Korea, they mostly steal intellectual property. Um, and there's lots of different reports in recent years that uh, that either we have put out or even um, antivirus companies that have tracked some of their activities. So if you want to 
you can pretty much find reports on about any of these countries um, that are out there and publicly available on the internet. Um, Non-state actors, uh, a lot of those tend to be more uh, crimeware and such. And uh, a little bit later in the slides, we will discuss some of the activities that go on with the non-state actors. Back to you, Brandon. Thanks. So before we start talking about um, these industrial control systems attacks, I just want to touch on the Purdue reference model real quick. Um, for those of you who aren't as familiar with control systems, so you have um, basically from layers five to zero, and it descends um, basically how close, going from five to zero, how close you are to the actual physical process or how close the component or information system or physical system is, is to the physical process. So. Um, the Purdue model is kind of showing its age, though. Generally, we've referred and seen, um, you know, IT and operational technology or ICS segmentation at around that layer three level, uh, but that's not necessarily a given. Um, if you have an entirely flat network or if you're leveraging cloud resources or industrial IoT, this can get very murky. So um, just understand that basically the true ICS, uh, in air quotes, uh, the, the items or information systems that are actually controlling the physical process or telling things to move or open or breakers to open or close, that's going to really be from layers three to zero. And uh, the MITRE attack for ICS framework actually starts on layer two. There are also a number of integrated systems that might have some level of control, like a distributed control system or supervisory control and data acquisition or SCADA. Um, these sorts of systems can kind of transcend that layer two all the way down to layer one and layer zero. And oftentimes these are the typical Windows-based systems that might be running on Windows Server 2000 or 2003 or XP. Um, so these are the systems that can, can really hold your fate and both help you and hurt you from a defensive perspective you know, as you're defending your network or if an adversary penetrates your network. So most of the activity we're going to be talking about are really on these layer two and integrated DCS and SCADA systems um, where adversaries have caused a physical impact from a cyber attack. Now the next slide is the MITRE ICS attack framework or attack for ICS framework. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You know, it, it's a big chart. I just want to note that it does mesh with attack for enterprise IT. It does not replace it. So essentially, the, the best thing to do when you're talking about the full attack lifestyle in a holistic manner, or the full attack life cycle, excuse me, in a holistic manner is really you want to integrate attack for IT and then ICS attack as well. Um, we're not doing that in this slide deck just for the sake of time. We're going to focus on post-exploitation activity and then really just, just the ICS to walk through the, the attacks themselves. So uh, just know there's a good blog from uh, FireEye and Mandiant and might have contributed to it as well uh, that talks about the integration of the two. Just know that there's some overlap and they're, they're complementary of each other, but they're not replacements. So now we're going to talk about a few case studies. So the first case study we're going to talk about is actually uh, from this year, uh, April of this year. Um, over the Israeli independence holiday in late April, they experienced a number of cyber attacks in mostly agricultural areas, um, very geographically disparate systems that were controlling um, mostly just water uh, flow control and sewage systems. Um, essentially, what happened was the, uh, the operators noticed a disruption, something wasn't acting, acting right, and they actually looked closer at some of the systems, and they found that a number of their internet-connected systems were compromised. Um, they weren't compromised in any sophisticated activity. We're talking systems that either had default credentials and a web interface to log into, or no authentication at all. Uh, what the attackers then did is they exploited these systems. They, they did the um, um, reconnaissance probably through a system like Shodan. Um, and then they actually changed the ladder logic on the system. Now, depending on the vendor um, line that was affected, you either need standard vendor software like a 
WinCC for Siemens or Factory Talk for Rockwell and Allen Bradley, where you actually draw out your logic and talk about what the system's going to do. Um, so what the attackers did is they pulled the project file that holds all this logic off, and they essentially changed set points. So set points are this pump is going to run at this specific speed if the pressure is you know this psi, or if the flow is you know this specific speed or speed or pressure. I'm going to open this valve to this certain degree. Um, so they didn't cause any damage, but they did cause a disruption. Um, so no loss of control, no loss of safety, no big boom. Um, but this was very much a uh, sort of a smash and grab job, if you will, that these, these systems were targets of opportunity and then they were impacted. So ransomware. Um, we could probably talk all day about ransomware, truthfully, or, or all morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, it's very active and, and we're seeing it more and more in control systems networks as well. So going back to the Purdue model, um, even, even mature organizations that have network segmentation, they do have slip ups in the sense that their network's not completely segmented or they have an integrated active directory or they have access control list or a DMZ, but they're allowing you know, 3389, which is RDP across and, and adversaries are moving laterally to that. Um, we had a specific case study uh, where a pipeline compressor station was ransomware, but there also have been a number of international case studies as well. Um, you know, Locker Goga, Megacortex, and also the Snake, Ekin, Snake Hose ransomware that actually has the capability to shut down industrial processes, um, but not encrypt the entire system and essentially brick it like, you know, uh, a Locker Goga did, um, which was very disruptive. Uh, the specific case study that we have, and there's there's a link to it as well, um, you can find it with a quick Google. Um, essentially, uh, a typical spear phishing attachment, um, external remote services uh, like SMB and RDP were available from the IT segment of the network to the operational technology segment of the network. And just about all the Windows systems were ransomware. Um, this caused a denial of view and a loss of availability, but I want to highlight that it didn't deny control and it didn't cause a loss of control. That's because these lower la layer devices like a programmable logic controller or uh, an RTU, uh, those systems that actually have the logic uploaded to them, they were not affected because they were not Windows based systems. However, the systems that were monitoring this for safety and control purposes they were adversely affected. So what they decided to do, even though everything was still running properly, but they couldn't validate or review it, is shut everything down, restore from backup, and they had to revalidate the entire physical process. It took about two and a half days. So uh, a lot of time and effort was wasted there. Derek? Okay, Black Energy. <clears throat> um, we've presented on this numerous times over the years. Uh, it may not be as used uh, today, but it's still very important to talk about because um, when we do assessments and such, there's still locations that may not be patched and fully up to date on stuff and uh, could still be vulnerable to even reusing black energy again. Um, when everything started up, uh, we found traces of the malware that dated back to at least 2011. Um, the campaign that went on uh, pretty much compromised uh, hundreds of systems worldwide and then dozens in the U.S. Uh, in most cases, they were internet-facing devices, uh, so they weren't segmented and, and deep down in networks. They were real easily to access, um, and so the malware didn't have to actually find its way through a system. The threat actors didn't have to find their way through the systems. They simply were able to locate uh, HMIs that were facing the internet and then uh, exploit at that time zero day vulnerabilities. Um, since then, obviously, most of those are patched. And Derek, I, I just want to add to that too. So what's, what's important about Black Energy is it actually exploited ICS software on the device. So it targeted a few specific vendor lines, um, many of which are ubiquitous in the US and really just the West in general. Um, but it actually was ICS specific malware in the, in the sense that it, it 
leverage the vulnerability and object linking and embedding. So very similar to uh, some of the, the old office macro vulnerabilities um, in terms of the plumbing. So um, in the dark gray here in the slide deck, these are the actual um, case studies where we saw Black Energy doing this activity. Um, but at its heart, Black Energy was a reconnaissance tool, um, a remote access Trojan. That's really what Black Energy 3.0 was, but it's highly modular. And then the light gray, these are some of the capabilities that Black Energy could have had. So Black Energy very easily could have disrupted the physical process just based on that very small beachhead that, that we observed in internet exposed devices. Yep, correct. Yeah, being modular, uh, you could pretty much build on about anything you wanted. And uh, so you have Black Energy make the initial uh, connection and access to a system. And then um, you can load up any other modules and have it take uh, steps to do anything you can imagine pretty much after that, whatever you have access to do. I think that covers that slide pretty well. So back to you for Ukraine. Thanks. All right, so the Ukraine 2015 attack, in, in my opinion, this is this is one of the most important ones and often under talked about because it caused a really long disruption. Um, the asset owners were, were first uh, forced to revert to manual operations for, for several months. So essentially, here's what we do now. Um, and there's a lot that we don't just because there was uh, kill this role in, in destroying a lot of artifacts. Um, so we don't have good data on a lot of the reconnaissance, discovery, lateral movement, and really weaponization of this attack. But what we do know is in 2015, there was a large scale phishing campaign um, all throughout Ukraine targeting a number of services, uh, it's well documented. And we know that Black Energy was that Black Energy 3.0, which was not ICS specific malware, but really just a remote access Trojan. Um, Black Energy 3 probably got that initial foothold and actually got the valid credentials. From there, the adversaries did pivot to the industrial network, which was segmented, but they used valid VPN and regular enterprise IT credentials to then penetrate the OT portion of the network. From there, they used living off the land techniques and regular vendor software. So we're talking like really just an elevated command prompt and using things like net use and IP config to just enumerate the network, the various systems, and then drop their various tools on the devices. When they actually cut or uh, started to open up the breakers to shut the proverbial lights off and open the circuits to remove the flow of electricity, they, um, they use remote desktop access. So just an internal Microsoft tool there's actually uh, some videos floating around where the operator is fighting with the uh, Russian operator over the mouse as they're clicking breakers open and, and shutting down these circuits. Once they opened up these breakers, um, they deployed kill disk to then kill these HMIs that had the control. And then they launched a denial of service from the serial to IP converters that actually were used mo most of these um, ICS devices, specifically in the electric sector um, and electric relays use a lot of serial technology. So we use serial IP because serial only has, you know, say a hundred meter cable run at most. Um, so they use serial IP converters to basically talk to the various substations and they use the de denial of service to kind of blow those bridges um, and deny communication. So luckily, uh, the Ukrainians had a willingness to revert to manual operations, send out the various operators to the substations and start manually closing the breakers to restore the flow of electricity. But they were forced in manual operations for as much as six months in some places. Now, Ukraine 2016 was, was very different in the sense that they went up one level. So at the distribution level in electricity, that's sort of the lowest level of the pyramid. And that's where you see all of these various substations and the levels above that that manage substations to get electricity into individual buildings and homes and areas. Um, at the larger scale, we have electric transmission. So when electric is generated at a power plant, it then goes to electric through electric transmission uh, systems to actually get to the individual substations. So this is sort of a step above that, right? This is these are the power lines uh, that you see that are very large, and you can essentially they have a highway under them, um, cleared trees throughout. So larger scale electricity here. 
And this specific attack was targeted at an area that was very automated. Um, this was the crash override or end destroyer malware that's, that's often been talked about, and it was highly modular. The big takeaways here is, yes, this malware is extremely sophisticated, and then it was also very modular, so it targeted uh, very specific protocols and very specific items. The other big takeaway here is most of the adversary's effect was, again, used off of living off the land techniques to get the data to weaponize the attack. Um, we were very lucky here in the sense that several of these modules, because they weren't actually, the protocols weren't actually written to spec, they failed. So the uh, Ciprotech DDoS attack, for example, um, that failed because the, the IP was encoded wrongly in the attack code. So it actually came out transposed. So they didn't actually hit the target. This would have sent the device into a firmware update and then that protective relay would not have been able to balance the flow of electricity as items were restored. Um, the targeting was much larger, but because several protocols and attack modules were not implemented to spec, it actually did fail, luckily enough. Um, Kill Disk, again, did have a role here, or not necessarily Kill Disk, but the wiper module of this malware um, had a more destructive role. And then also the, um, the IEC 101 module did deploy correctly. So we did see some localized outages, but it could have been much worse if some of these other attack modules would have done their job correctly. Um, so sort of dodged a bullet here proverbially, uh, but could have been much worse, could have resulted in a loss of safety or an actual damaging of equipment as a larger scale outage, uncontrolled respirations, um, and then other, other systems that balance the power and the flow of electricity on the grid being in a firmware update um, could have caused uh, more serious damage, but did not. Derek? All right. Triton, Trisis, and Hatman. Um, Hatman is what we called it. Uh, Triton and Trisis are the other names that you can find public reports on as well. Um, all the reports go highly in depth um, into all the specifics behind the malware. Uh, it was one of probably the most sophisticated pieces of malware we've uh, dealt with simply because, uh, you know, with Black Energy, it was compromising HMIs. Um, you can use it even just as a, a Trojan and get access to systems. But even if you compromise those systems and start you know, manipulating an HMI, telling things to open close, you still have those safety systems that could potentially cover you. With Triton Trisis Hatman, it basically compromised the safety systems so that they wouldn't respond correctly. Um, you could potentially tell that system to allow any um, access, any actions through it. So, once you compromise it, then you use an HMI or whatnot and tell the system to uh, overspin and uh, potentially uh, blow up equipment. And the safety system normally would know these different baselines and help protect the system. But if you tell it not to, then obviously it's just gonna allow anything through. Um, and for the most part, it also would make it to where even the um, operators aren't seeing things happening. Uh, you could have it lie back to the uh, operators. Um, initially, when it was discovered, it was because it had a flaw in the programming. And uh, the Tricon X, Tricon system is highly sensitive on timing. Um, all of the operations happen fairly slowly through it, and there's specific timing to it. And the malware initially pushed uh, its exploit too fast and it ended up crashing the system. So the company discovered something was going on, you know, their system safety system went offline. Uh, they started looking through things, had the manufacturer come over and that's when they found the malware. Um, we are positive that in very short time, the threat actor fixed the malware and uh, could be using it because 
once we got samples of the malware, it didn't take us too long to uh, fix it and make it work without even being able to see it. Um, so again, highly sophisticated because there was no way to even notice that malware being activated um, or even find it on the system. Uh, so we worked with the manufacturer um, in, at one of their facilities and kind of found out some uh, ways that they could use their devices and different uh, testing equipment to potentially see if that malware is on the system. Um, but this was extremely uh, important step in the evolution of the malware for ICS because it is, you know, when you take the safety system offline, it's just, you can have catastrophic events if you wanted to. Yeah, and I, I would just want to add in there as well, um, when you're actually causing a, a physical impact, these systems are designed to fail in a safe state. So um, say a water line is, is rated to go to a certain degree or a pressurized tank, for example. Um, the safety systems are that additional safety net. And, and really the implication on this malware, um, Triton Crisis Hat Man is, is essentially how you make a plant go boom. Um, if a pipeline compressor station, for example, gets ransomware and some sort of physical event happens and we lose all control, a safe failure would still be something called a blowdown where a big fireball shoots up and it's actually a controlled failure. Um, exploiting the safety system prevents a controlled failure from possibly happening. And that's how you cause damage or potentially loss of life. And this specific victim being a very large petrochemical facility uh, could have absolutely released noxious gases or dangerous gases, and then also, you know, potentially cause some sort of uh, bigger event like explosion. So yep. That is our presentation. I know we ran through things quickly just for the sake of time. Um, I think we do have a couple questions that we can go ahead and answer that came in in the Q&A. Yes. yes, indeed. So thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, before we start the Q&A, let me add something. Uh, you have, uh, I would like to comment that you have a very useful ICS portal on the uh, uscert.cesar.gov, and uh, I'll put that in the chat. And I highly recommend that attendees to have a look at it. So some question now. The first one is from uh, Stein Bankras. Is, uh, is it still called segmentation when you can just VPN into that segment? Um, <laughs> and a lot of places, it's still called an air gap, um, even, even when you can RDP in. Um, it, it's very contextual. I don't want to sit here and say that um, don't VPN, don't have network segmentation. There are a lot of legitimate business cases, um, specifically in manufacturing, for example, where they have just-in-time ordering or they need to keep track of you know, various chemicals or materials to track their cost and their output. So... There are many use cases to do so. It's really just finding that sweet spot between enabling the business and then having detection and response or compensating controls to prevent malicious activity from happening. Or if you can't prevent it, actually um, you know, detecting it uh, in a reasonable time uh, to respond. Uh, a similar question or related question uh, from an anonymous uh, attendee. How does C2 communicate to the attacker if the ICS environment is not connected to the internet? So there's, um, in the case of Ukraine 2016, for example, the crash override malware did actually have the capability to use a localized proxy. And then they had a jump box that went from the ICS or the jump box actually sat in the IT network and then communicated outbound. So there were some hard coded credentials there. Um, in other cases, uh, probably some sort of proxy or having some sort of jump box, but um, there in a lot of cases are unknown connections, dual home devices. It's really just breaking that boundary if there is a boundary and then moving from there. Another one uh, from uh, Jens uh, Wiener. Will ICS targeted ransomware become a relevant threat? Um, I, I think so. It, it's just what you define ICS targeted ransomware. If you look at some of the targeteering from ransomware actors or gangs or crews, however you refer to them, um, you'll see that the medical sector is um, sort of getting clobbered right now very aggressively. 
Um, we've seen similar activity uh, in the energy sector in the U.S., specifically um, you know, this pipeline ransomware activity. So I think traditional destructive ransomware strains are getting very close. If you talk about Snake and Ekans actually having the ability to shut down these processes, but you know these systems are now looking for ICS-specific processes to stop but not encrypt the entire directory and brick the device. So I, I think we're getting close, but I think you'll see the medical sector, um, sort of that IoT uh, type of ransomware. I think that's going to be the bridge before you see larger scale, you know, manufacturing attacks or whatever. Um, I think critical infrastructure, when you talk about energy and water, um, those are a little more provocative to attack, but I, I wouldn't put it past the threat actors are quite brazen, so. Good, and the final question from, uh, from Kauto. How do you see the development of ICS environment cybersecurity requirements? Uh, do you have already uh, um, appropriate standard in place? It really depends on the sector. Um, I would say that probably the ISA 99 and 62443 standards are the most robust that sort of cover both the traditional enterprise and IT and then also the actual ICS. Um, but there are a number of ways to accomplish this. I think it's more convincing your stakeholders that these systems are different because they have a different life cycle, they're doing a different job, and then putting your governance on top of that. Because we're still not going to be able to prevent every single ICS attack, and we do have some inherent vulnerabilities, but you can mitigate this risk in the right way, and it's, it's doing that for your organization and the way that makes the most sense. Um, I work in the Department of the Defense part-time. So we have, you know, military installations that have large-scale infrastructures like smart cities, essentially. And we can't just rip out every single device that talks backnet because it's unauthenticated protocol. We don't have, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to just replace every single installation. So you have to find that sweet spot that makes sense for your organization and not necessarily, you have to find a standard or a framework that aligns, but you can't necessarily be married to any one standard or framework. Okay. And uh, a final one, uh, most ICS equipment cannot be installed with endpoint security software such as EDR or others. So what would be the, the practical way to monitor security in the ICS world? Um, in my opinion, you get the most value from a robust security baseline just because most industrial control systems are trying to maintain a state. So they're trying to do the same thing over and over. They're trying to keep a building to a certain temperature. They're trying to keep power flowing or they're trying to keep water flowing or batch chemical process, whatever. So that network traffic is going to be very, very normalized. And if you look at specifically like these Ukraine attacks and also Triton Crisis Hatman, there were a lot of opportunities for the defender to catch the adversary with unauthorized connections. Um, so I think monitoring, detection, and response are, are really key to preventing these attacks or at least addressing them. Um, because in order to, you know, affect an ICS style, you know, true impact, the adversary has to weaponize an attack and they have to do so with large scale reconnaissance and then they have to pre-stage their tools as well. So there's a lot of opportunities to catch the adversary. Um, I don't think EDR on a PLC is, is going to get you a whole lot of value, but maybe Sysmon on like a SCADA server or a historian that's sort of that bridge point between an ICS network and you know traditional IT network, you can get a whole lot of value there. Or if you have you know a true network boundary or DMZ, again, a ton of value in NetFlow and firewall logs and connection logs as well. Okay, as we have one more minute, uh, final one. Uh, do you see the ICS response, incident response readiness improving or declining, uh, given that multiple high-profile breaches are becoming public and lessons learned are being shared with the ICS community? I definitely think it's going to be um, moving in the right direction. I, I think that, that uh, entities are waking up, uh, specifically with ransomware as well. Um, I think we're detecting more attacks just because ransomware is so destructive. It wasn't that we haven't seen malware before in control systems networks, but until it causes some sort of disruption to the process, uh, we don't necessarily know or we don't necessarily address it. But now that we see advanced adversaries actually trying to cause physical effects, and we also see ransomware crews causing adverse impact. I think we can take those lessons learned and then give them to you know, our individual uh, leaderships when we're talking about you know, what we're doing for the organization. 
I think resiliency and security is supposed to be a business enabler. We're not supposed to be the department of no. Um, nothing will get you um, or lose you more credibility on the operation side of your organization than impacting the physical process. So don't load very heavy tools on this PLC that might be vulnerable. But if you're going to ingest some data, maybe through a sysmon on there that's very uh, much more passive, less likely to impact something, and you can get a whole lot of value out of that. So I think the more we talk about these attacks, the further that snowball will kind of get bigger. And I think the community will grow, but there's certainly, certainly a long way to go before we have a robust understanding of the problem. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to thank you, uh, Brandon and Derek, for uh, for your great presentation and for uh, answering the, the questions. Uh, thanks to all of you, virtual attendees, especially to those who ask questions. I hope you enjoy this presentation and the Q&A as much as I did. And the session is now over, so you could have a, a break uh, for uh, something like uh, 25 minutes. And uh, so please uh, log off from this session and uh, hope to see you in the next uh, session starting in uh, 20 mi 25 minutes. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.